Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Today, our topic is going to be very simple, and that is the kingdom mandate of Jesus' assignment. I want you to take notes this morning because I got a lot to cover in a short time. Our topic this morning is the kingdom mandate, which is the assignment of Jesus. What a topic to talk about. The assignment of Jesus. All those joining us by television, you are in the right place at the right time to hear the right message from the right God. That's Jehovah Jireh. We're so glad you're joining us here from the beautiful Bahama Islands. We welcome you all around the world watching our program today. And you are part of a series we're going through the Bible, studying especially from the book of Genesis, also the New Testament. We're studying the kingdom of God from the New Testament. And I'm starting this year off dealing with discovering your kingdom leadership. And we're going to get into this in more detail, but the session today is dealing with the assignment of Jesus, which is kingdom mandate. Everybody in the world was born to fulfill an assignment. In other words, every human was created by God to solve a problem. There's something that God wanted done that required your existence. So you are not a mistake. Can I hear an amen? amen. Imagine that. God wanted something to fly, so he made birds. He wanted something to swim, so he made fish. There's something God wanted done, so he created you. So your place on this planet is related to an assignment that God had in his mind before anything was. And that makes you very critical to God's global and universal program. Today we're going to talk about the assignment of somebody who is the creator of all things, and that is Jesus Christ. What was his assignment? And I do want to say that uh, when we talk about the assignment of Jesus, we're really talking about the assignment of God. And uh, when we look at the assignment of Jesus, it's very clear. The first we're going to understand what did God have in mind when he sent Jesus. I want to pick up reading a statement from the book of Matthew 24, a verse that we've read last week, and then one from verse, Matthew verse 4, 4, verse 17. The first verse I want you to take a note of. Read it with me out loud, please. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached where? In all the world as a testimony to all nations and then what would happen then the end would come so the end of the world is predictable a lot of people say we don't know when the world will end well Jesus tells us when the only thing we don't know is the hour the exact hour but we do know what's gonna make it happen and it's found in that verse he says when this good news of the kingdom of God is preaching to all the world then the end will come Matthew 4, 17, Jesus began to preach. Matthew 4, 17 is the beginning of his ministry on earth. The first statement of Jesus as a businessman is the declaration of his mission. Every effective company has to have a mission statement. Every effective organization must have a clear vision statement. Every successful family needs to have a clear objective in mind to be successful. And the first thing you present as an organization to be successful is you've got to define and crystallize your mission statement. This statement, Matthew 4, 17, is the first public statement declared by Jesus concerning his mission on earth, his assignment. Let's read it together. Matthew 4, 17, his first public statement. First word is what? Repent. So his first word has to do with your mentality. Repent means to change your mind, to change the way you think. Then his next statement is, because the kingdom of heaven has arrived. The King James says, is at hand. So Christ declares right away in his first statement what his business is about. He says, my business is twofold. Number one, I come to change your thinking. Why? Because I came to reintroduce a kingdom. That's my assignment. I came to bring back to the planet 
the kingdom of God, which is the kingdom of heaven, and I came to change your thinking so you can live in it. That was his assignment. That is why when they asked him about the end of the world, he said the end of the world will happen when the whole world gets my assignment. What's the assignment? In Matthew 24, he says this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to every nation, every ethnos, every group. That's why Christ ain't going to come right now. A lot of people are preaching and prophesying that this is the end times. I got a problem with that. Because we got 6.2 billion people on earth. One billion is now in India. India just became over a billion people. And 98% of that one billion are Hindus, Buddhists, and Muslims. 10% are Christians. You know God cannot come unless they hear about the kingdom of God. Then there's one billion in China. And 1% of the people in China. One billion, one percent are Christians. That means most of them are Buddhists, Shintoists, they are Muslims, or they are involved in some spiritism movement. They have never heard the gospel of the kingdom of God. In Africa alone, there are over 500 million people in just northern Africa, and another 800 million people down in southern Africa in those states so you're talking about almost a billion people or more in the African continent and many of them are animists they evolve in all kinds of spiritist worship but thank God Christianity is taking a stronghold in Africa but many of them have still not heard the gospel of the kingdom of God but here's the saddest news of all in Europe and in the West where we live in the Americas and in the Caribbean, and in Canada, <laughs> there are over 80% Christians. But I dare challenge a thought that 90% of them have never heard the gospel of the kingdom of God. Many Christians have never heard the kingdom message. And that's why we're teaching this in this series. Much of what we've heard has been the means to the kingdom but not the kingdom we've heard about the way to the kingdom but not the kingdom as a matter of fact we've made the process the gospel and this is why most Christians don't know about the kingdom of God I am here to tell you that Jesus never preached born again as the gospel. Jesus mentioned the term born again once in his whole ministry and we preach it all the time. He never preached it. Secondly, he never said those words to the public. He never said thou shalt be born again to the multitudes. He never did. He mentioned it only once in his ministry and it was mentioned 2 a.m. in the morning to an old man who was also a, a, a priest in the temple at 2 a.m. just to one person. And yet we've made born again the gospel. But there's one thing that Jesus did speak all the time. And we find it in his first statement in Matthew 4, wasn't it? What does he say? Repent for the kingdom of heaven has arrived. And from that point forward, he had only one message. The kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God. I mean, every single day, he just had one message. The kingdom of God is like. Every parable, the kingdom of God is like. Every miracle, the kingdom has come upon you. Every authority, the kingdom of God speaks. He preached one message, the kingdom of God. And yet, most of us don't know what he's talking about. And that's why we've got to study his assignment because his assignment is your assignment. He left us to complete the work that he started in the ministry. He turned it over to his disciples, which is what you're supposed to be, and he told them exactly what to preach and what to teach and what to share. And there's no doubt about it. I one more thing I want to say before we get into the next statement, and that is this. Jesus really never preached prosperity, 
healing, baptism in the Holy Ghost. The things that we preach as the kingdom, no, he didn't. He did those things. He, he showed those things, but they were not his message. His message was this kingdom thing. Why? Because the kingdom is the entire motivation of God. Why did Jesus come to preach the kingdom of God? First of all, it has to do with God's original plan. First of all, God's original plan begins this way. God's intent was to extend his heavenly kingdom on earth through mankind. That's his first intent. So in order to find out God's, God's destination, you've got to discover where God been. The Bible is a strange book because the Bible is really a book that takes you backward to where you came from. God is taking us back to where we fell from. We call the disobedience of Adam, we call it the fall. So what I'm going to do is show you what fall means because it was so simple to me years ago, I missed it. Here's what fall means. Look at me. I'm holding in my hand a book. I'm going to place this book in a certain position. That's why I want the book. That's my original place for the book. Well, the book has a problem and the book falls. So that's called the fall. Now, if I'm going to restore this book to where it fell from, what am I going to do? I'm going to put it where? Okay? So, this is what God did. The book couldn't get itself back up. <laughs> so God had to come down, pick the book back up, and he personally places it back where it fell from. Now, if I were to pick this book back up and place it over here, did I restore it? No. Why? Because I placed it where it did not fall from. So restoration means to store back to the original place. What we have been doing as religious people, not me but y'all, is we've been trying to tell God to put us somewhere we didn't fall from and not where we fell from. We keep telling God to put us in heaven. We didn't fall from heaven. We fell from authority in the earth. <laughs> Satan fell from heaven, not man. So heaven is not God's goal for you. And this is why religion has been such a challenge to God. Because his difficulty is getting his own family to get the message. We sing songs like, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. In when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. And that song sounds so good. And while we're singing that, we're thinking about mortgage, phone bill, light bill, water bill, tuition fees. You'll be getting away from that stuff. That's why we like that song. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. We love those songs. But those songs are not God's goal for you. God's goal is to get you back where you fell from. Where'd you fall from? According to the word of God, you fell from where God placed you. Where did God place you? He placed you in the book of Genesis in dominion over the fish, the birds, the plants, the cattle, and all the earth. That's where God placed you. You were established by God to be the king dominion over the earth. So restoration is God putting you back in dominion over the earth. So the program of God is really originally to extend his kingdom on earth and secondly to establish a family of sons not servants who would establish the kingdom on earth for him as sons and not subjects 
Also, God wants to establish, therefore, a commonwealth of citizens, not Christians. God desired, therefore, relationship and not religion. And that's important to note because, you see, we have made what God wants into a religion, and God really hates this stuff. God doesn't want religion. He wants relationship. God wants you to be closer to him on Monday than you are on Sunday. Because the rituals impress people, but the relationship impresses God. God's more concerned there about a daily communion with him between you and he spiritually than he is about you standing up in a worship service singing hymns. Because that's really uh, a demonstration of these traditions that we go through. But many times we have no relationship with God. That's why in the Garden of Eden with Adam, there was no church meetings, no prayer meetings, no altars, no, no sacrifices, no, no worship songs. There was no clapping. There was no dancing. There was no hymn books. There were no prophets and apostles and evangelists and pastors and teachers. There was none of this stuff we call religion. And yet there was what? Man and God. And man was doing what? He walked and talked with God, the Bible says, in the cool of the day without having to go through a workup through a worship team. That's what you fell from. Now, if God's going to restore us, he has to be what? Truthful to himself. If God restores you to something you didn't fall from, then God is lying. And the Bible said, let God be true and every man a liar, which means God's ultimate program is to put you back in leadership authority over the earth. And he wants us to do that now. Now, a lot of people say, well, we'll become in authority in the future, in the new earth. Uh, we'll, <laughs> you know, when we all get to heaven and, and then we all come back, then we'll rule the earth and, and that's when God, so we'll just kind of suffer right now and be poor and, and, and catch trouble. And then when Christ takes us out of this mess through the rapture, then we'll come back and then we can have our chance and we can really be in charge. That's not religious people think. Read the statement of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. He says, look, repent. Why? He didn't say the kingdom of God will come later. He said the kingdom of God has arrived. The disciple says, but we know in the future. He said, no, no, no. The kingdom of God is already with you. And when I release the Holy Ghost, he's going to be in you. The kingdom of God is not, hmm, it's not really a physical territory. The kingdom of God is a jurisdiction over which the influence of God have full authority. The kingdom of God is actually in my neighborhood right now where my house is. Why? Because I live there. That piece of property that I own is the kingdom of God's property. Oh, help me, Lord. Wherever you are and you influence, the kingdom of God has come to that place. Let me break it down a little bit. The Bible never calls you a Christian. Pagans did that. The Bible never calls you a subject. The heathens do that. The Bible never calls you a, a servant. Religion calls you that. The Bible says that many as believed on him to them give you the authority to call themselves what? Sons of God, not servants. We're family to God. Now, the Bible also calls you, write this word down please, ambassador. Everybody say ambassador. The Bible does call you that. You are ambassador. We name this, this building properly. A lot of people don't understand why I named this building the Diplomat Center. It's because I understand what we're here for. Ambassadors work in diplomatic centers. They do diplomacy for the government they represent. So when you walk through this door, you ain't a Christian no more. 
He was suddenly an appointee of the government, an official agency representing the kingdom government of God. You are now sitting in the legislative session of this particular gathering of diplomats and I am the Chief Secretary of State and I'm delivering to you from the Constitution the mind of my government so you can know what to do when you go out of here. I know exactly my position and I know what I'm doing. Everybody say ambassador. ambassador. Say it again. Ambassador. Repeat after me. I'm no longer Christian. No longer Christian. I am an ambassador of Christ. See, if you think correctly, you live correctly. Let me tell you something about ambassadors. When a country appoints an ambassador and sends them into a foreign territory to represent their government, do you know what that country does first? The first thing that the country does who appoints the ambassador is that they purchase property in that country. Now, the property they purchase is actually the country. I'm going to say this slowly because some of you don't understand diplomacy. When a country buys property in another country for its embassy so that its diplomats can do its work, that property in that country becomes the country that bought it. It becomes the country. That is why if a Bahamian has a problem and somehow the law is after them and they somehow got into the United States Embassy's property, do you realize that the police cannot cross that barrier? So you didn't know that. It's illegal for them to enter that property. Why? That's the United States. They must now apply to the U.S. government whose jurisdiction that is and request that the government of the United States release that Bahamian out of the property so he could be arrested. You see, you didn't know that. That's how powerful an embassy is. Because the kingdom of that country is over the property it owns. It's called asylum. Are you listening to me? So, wherever the authority of a government is, that becomes the government's property. And therefore, all the authority and rights and powers of that country comes to effect on that property. God says, you are ambassadors of Christ in heaven, and you are what? You are sojourners in the earth. Sojourners means you are in a foreign country, but the property belongs to the government of heaven. I like what the government of my country says. My government says, now here's the constitution. The constitution says, in article, well, it's, sub, it's section Psalm, subsection 68, article 14. It says, the earth is still the Lord's. And the fullness thereof. And all that, in other words, this whole place is my government's property. In other words, if you don't take charge, then it stays under someone else's influence. That is why you can cast the devil out of the earth. Because this is not his legal territory. It belongs to God's government and you are his citizens. Do you realize that when you bought a car, your car became government property? Hey, Lord, that feel good. When you got your house or your apartment, every time you pay your rent, you are confirming that this piece of property belongs to the government of God. But you see, we think religious. That's why the devil lives in our house. <laughs> Hallelujah. God told Trina Vision, he said, look, I tell you all what, the death angel is going to come over Egypt. And the death angel is going to kill everything. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to make your house heaven's property. 
That's kingdom business he's dealing with. He said, look, there's somehow, I've, could, I've got to put a sign over your property so the angel will know that's we own. You get it? So God said, I want you to kill a lamb and dip the branch in the blood and put the blood across the lintel and the doorpost. He says, and when the dead angel comes, he'll look and he'll go, heaven's property, and he'll pass over. When you are a citizen, you are under government jurisdiction. When you are a Christian, you are under religion. You know, I was uh, living in a hotel uh, last night before I got here, and they put me on the 11th floor. It was a request, but they were going to put me on the 14th floor. And I said, no, ma'am, I do not live above the 11th floor. She said, why? I said, I'm a diplomat. <laughs> she said, Oh, okay, I understand. Sorry, sir. And she put me on the 11th floor. Some of you are trying to figure out what I mean, eh? No government leader and no diplomat of any country will live above the 12th floor. Do you know why? Because the, the fire engine ladder... Cannot go above the 13th floor. See, y'all like, y'all behave as y'all like behind. First one to heaven when the fire comes. You just learned some of diplomacy, yeah? As a part of the, of the diplomatic corps in my country, we had to have briefing. They had to brief me. And they told me certain things that I must not do. And that was one of them. Secondly, you will never have the two top leaders traveling together in diplomacy. Because when two leaders are together, there's a danger to the whole country. Because if both die, there's chaos. So the prime minister and the deputy will never fly on the same flight. You didn't notice that. President Bush and Dick Cheney will never travel together on the same airplane. It goes against diplomacy. That's why when two powerful men and women of God get together, they ain't supposed to fly together. You see, because all the hell get excited, two at one stroke. Come on, talk to me. Devil ain't no fool. Where there's a congregation of power, that's when Satan gets excited. Because he gets to destroy a lot at once. That's why Christ told the disciples, meet me on the other side. You go by yourself. Why? Because you all been in me now for three years. You all are dangerous. See, you understand? Kingdom thinking. When an ambassador comes into your presence, it's not a person anymore. It's a country. <laughs> Hallelujah. When you meet an ambassador, you're not meeting a person. You're meeting a country. So when you meet me, you're not meeting a person anymore. You're meeting heaven. And when they meet you at your work tomorrow, they're not supposed to be meeting a person. But you see, you're too religious. You're still thinking you're just a, 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 you know, a sinner saved by grace. No, you are... A nation walking on two legs. <laughs> That's why an ambassador is protected more than the president. Hmm. They would they would assassinate a president before they kill an ambassador. Did you know that? That's right. That's right. Because the president represents the votes but the ambassador represents the nation that's why God calls you an ambassador not a president 
If you touch an ambassador, the entire army comes to get you. If you touch a president, it's called an assault. If you touch an ambassador, it is called an international incident. Y'all are slow. That means when you touch me, every angel picks up a sword. Y'all ain't got this yet. That's why I'm such an audacious young man. I'm bold because I understand the constitution of my country. Jesus came to restore that kingdom of sons back to earth. That's why it was him who told Pilate when Pilate says, I've got power to give you life with my thumb or to give you death. Why? I represent Caesar. Christ never spoke during the trial until Pilate said that. Because now Pilate talking kingdom talk. So Jesus cleared his throat. <clears throat> Blood all dried all over his face. And he said, Mr. Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. And even now, if I give the signal, that in your Bible, if I give the signal right now, 10 legions of angels will come into this castle and wipe this place out. He threatened Pilate. I don't know what happened to Pilate, but Pilate must have felt the words in his bones. Something shuddered in his body. And Pilate, the Bible says, from that time forward, tried to let him go. <laughs> Lift your hands and praise God. That's a powerful threat. <laughs> and Jesus said, just like the Father sent me, so send I you. When somebody threatens you tomorrow, so they're going to fire you, just smile and say, <laughs> My kingdom is not of this world. And even now, if I give the signal. <laughs> oh, come on, praise the Lord, somebody. <laughs> See, now, the problem with you religious people is you think I'm joking. I'm serious. The Bible says the angels have been given charge. Charge means responsibility concerning you to keep you in all of your ways and they are ministering spirits sent forth to protect and minister to those and to do the bidding of those who are heirs of salvation. Hebrews chapter 2. You've got thousands of angels waiting for your orders. And all you're saying is, I'm a Christian. I'm suffering. Ain't just saying, you ain't supposed to be suffering. You just ain't giving me nothing to do. <laughs> Lift your right hand. And put it after me. In the name of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus. Angels, Angels. I, know I, I know who I am. I am an ambassador. Am ambassador. And you work for my government. For my government. I, command you, I command you. Go to my house now and watch over all that belongs to me. Go to my car, protect my property. Go over my children, preserve them. Angels, go into this week ahead of me and make my way straight. In the name of the Lord Jesus, go. See, they're gone. It's authority. It's authority. Therefore, God's real purpose is kingdom. And it's found in this verse we always talk about. Let us make man in our own image, our likeness, and let them have what? Dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the air. That means the rule of God in the visible world was God's original desire. I want to repeat these statements, if you can write them down if you're interested. To rule God's program is to rule the visible from the invisible. Through the invisible, living in the invisible, that is in the visible on the visible. In other words, God wanted to rule the seen from the unseen, living in the unseen, that is in the seen on the seen. Got that, young man? We try it again. God's desire was to rule the seen world through the unseen Holy Spirit, living in the unseen spirit of man, in the seen body on the seen earth. 
So the key to God's rulership is that unseen living in the unseen. As long as the Holy Spirit is inside a person's spirit, then God's king dominion, king dominion, kingdom, his rulership can happen on earth. So when a man loses the Holy Spirit, then God's kingdom cannot happen on earth. Are you with me? Let me put it this way. If you've been appointed ambassador of a country, well, we got a good example here. We got a good example here. I was reading the newspapers two days ago, and, and the cover story was uh, Mr. Schechter, who was the former United States ambassador to the Bahamas. You all read that story? He has been what? Recalled. Okay, why? Because he was serving under a different government administration. When the government changed, oh hallelujah, then his powers were canceled. I'm going to bless myself in a minute. See, when you change governments, the power doesn't work no more. You're going to get it in a minute. There's a kingdom of darkness, and there's a kingdom of light. And you were born into the kingdom of darkness. That's why you couldn't help sinning. The power was in, in vogue. It, it was working. But the Bible says Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil and to set you free from the kingdom of darkness and to translate you into the kingdom of light. And therefore, we were once children of darkness. Now are we what? Children of light. And therefore, we walk in the light as he is in the light. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse from all of our sins and we have authority and fellowship one with another that means when you were taken from the kingdom of darkness and put in the kingdom of light as an ambassador all of Satan's power against you was no longer working that means you cannot represent the devil anymore now Mr. Schechter was withdrawn because his government changed they're sending their own ambassador back to the Bahamas. The one that the, the president will appoint. Now, if Mr. Schenker decides to stay in the Bahamas and parade around as ambassador of the United States, guess what? Nothing happens. He can walk up the streets, tell everybody I'm an ambassador. No one will shake his hands, bow to him, respect him anymore. Why? Because he is par par parading himself as something that he has no authority for. Sounds like some people who joined the church never had an encounter with Jesus, never been born again, never had the Holy Ghost in their lives, and yet they come to church taking communion. Saying you are an ambassador doesn't make you an ambassador. And Mr. Schechter is only ambassador as long as the government gives him that authority. Christ says, as many as believed on me, to them give I the power to call themselves sons of God. You realize that if you have given your life to the Lord and believe in him and receive the spirit, that it doesn't matter what no one say with you anymore. He told you you were a son of God. The government say you're a son of God. I don't care if you've been drinking dope, smoking grass, eating dumb food, whether you've been sleeping around or maybe in a prostitute, it doesn't matter anymore. Once you connect to the government of God, you are a son of God. Say it with me, I'm a son of God. Say it loud. Say it like you mean it. If you're a son of God, then God is your father. And if we're all sons of God, then we are all family, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Shake hands with your brother in the Lord right now. By the way, let me ask you a question. If you are someone's son, then you carry their last name. <laughs> so Isaac was called son of Abraham. <laughs> you are called son of God. Nothing's wrong with that. That's your last name. We got to think that way. That's what he wanted. God's desire, therefore, was to set up this kingdom of children who would represent him in the, in the, in the earth, and they would become his reps. Now, ladies and gentlemen, once you lose the connection with the government, what happens? You're no longer a representative. 
Mr. Schechter, watching a TV program probably somewhere in Texas. I spoke with him the other day. He's in Texas. That's where he's going to live, actually. He, he's no longer an ambassador. So he cannot represent the country. When Adam sinned, the government would recall the Holy Ghost. Get it? When Adam sinned, when he disobeyed God, the government recalled its power. Because the, the ghost that the government sends is a Holy Ghost. And Adam became an unholy container. <laughs> so the government withdrew its power. Holy Ghost went back. So now we got a guy parading like he representing God without any power. That's why the devil began to run our lives when Adam sinned. Because now we have no more power from the government. Oh, Lord, help me. So from Adam, chapter 3 of Genesis, all the way to Matthew, chapter 4, we have a, a family of ambassadors misrepresenting their government. They have no power. In the Old Testament, you may find this interesting, but in the Old Testament, do you realize that the Holy Ghost couldn't live in anybody all through the Old Testament? Why? Because the spirit of the government is holy, and the vessels are unholy. And there's not been any sacrifice made that was good enough to make the vessels holy. So the Holy Ghost only did one thing in the Old Testament. He would come upon them, they would prophesy, and he'd leave. He'd come upon Samson, he'd be strong, then he'd leave. He'd come upon Elisha, he would work a miracle, then he'd leave. He'd come upon Jacob, he would do something great, then he would leave. He'd come upon Enoch, he would do a great work, he would leave. He would come upon the works of Gideon and upon uh, Josiah. He'd come upon these great people and he'd work of miracles then he would leave why he couldn't live inside of them and therefore they could not execute the administration of the kingdom of God every day another statement that is used for the kingdom of God coming is the word of the Lord came unto me you ever heard that that means what the spirit of the Lord came unto me all through the Bible the word of the Lord came unto me I prophesied and then he left this happened all the way up to Malachi, last prophet in the Old Testament. Came upon Malachi, but Joel said something. Can I stand up in the chair? Joel says, now I don't understand this, but he came upon me this morning and he told me something. And in chapter 2, Joel says, there's a day coming when the Spirit of God will come upon all flesh. And he shall live in the young people and the old people and the young child have visions and the old shall dream dreams and the young women shall prophesy. He said the day is coming when this army shall be raised up full of the Holy Ghost. He says and that day is yet to come. It'll be the day of the Lord. Who's the Lord? Jesus. So Jesus comes back to earth. First declaration. Repent. Who was Jesus? Oh, just, just hang with me for a couple more minutes. Listen to what it says. It says, Jesus went into the desert, led by the Holy Spirit, and he was tested of the devil. He passed the test, and the Bible says, angels came and ministered unto him. Is that right? Then it says, and Jesus was filled with the Holy Ghost without measure. You want to hear a shock? As long as Jesus was on the earth, there's no record of the Holy Ghost being anywhere else. Nothing happened anywhere by the Holy Ghost because every ghost of the Holy Ghost was in him. Hallelujah. Why? He came to bring what? The connection to the kingdom. That's why he says the kingdom of God has returned. Why? I'm carrying it. Jesus' number one goal was not to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, or feed 5,000. That was not his goal. His ultimate assignment was to get that ghost back in you. That's 
why Calvary is not the gospel. <laughs> Even the blood is not the gospel. The gospel is what? The good news is that you can get the connection back. You can get the Holy Ghost back in you. You can be reconnected, Mr. Schechter, back to the administration in Washington. Lord have mercy. God says, repent, because the kingdom, what is the kingdom? All he had was the Holy Ghost. He said, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And they asked him, how will that be? He said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. If your son asks you for a, a bread, a roll, you wouldn't give him a stone. And if he asks you for an egg, you wouldn't give him a serpent. And said, how much more if you ask my father for the Holy Ghost, he'll give that to you. Everything you need is in the Holy Spirit. Because he is the reconnection to the government. The blood was a means to an end. Calvary was a means to an end. Calvary was to wash you, to make you holy, so that the Holy Spirit, the government connection, could get back in you. That's why Christ could not give them the Holy Ghost to live in them until after he had died and rose again and the blood was shed. The Bible says sometimes, twice, the Bible says he, he gave them power to go out and cast out demons, heal the sick, raise the dead, and preach the kingdom. He says, he gave them a little authority. He says, go. And he put some stuff on them, you see. And guess what happened? They went out, and what happened? The Bible says they cast out demons, they raised the dead, they healed the sick, and they came back excited, and they says, Master, we healed the sick, we raised the dead. He says, I know. He says, great. And he began to rejoice with them. Why? He said, you see how it feels? See what you all missed? He said, you guys got a little taste of your future. You got a little taste of your past. This is what Adam used to do, man. Adam was in charge of everything, controlled everything. You got a little taste of it. He rejoiced with them. Then he says, the time is coming when the kingdom of God that is with you shall be in you. So what does he do? He goes to the cross, sheds his blood, to remit your sins, to make you holy. He went to hell and got the keys of death out of the grave. So you won't have to be afraid of death and death can't hold you down no more because you got work to do. And then he rose again and declared, all authority is now given unto me in heaven, in earth, under the earth. Now I got it back. And the Bible says he, he pulled them to him and he <sighs> breathed on them. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And Paul understood it. Paul says, my God, the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink and big cars and big houses and fancy dress and nice suits. Even the kingdom of God is love, joy, and peace. Where? In the Holy Ghost. Lift your hands. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Tell the Holy Ghost, operate in you this week. Come on, praise him. Just thank him for a second. Tell him to rule your territory through you this week. Your job, your house, the place that you work, the place that you are in charge of. Let the Holy Ghost take charge through you. That's kingdom. That's kingdom. When you walk into a board meeting, you ain't no normal member of the board. See, that's your problem. You think you're just a Christian. That's like, I ain't no Christian on the board. Leave me alone. I used to be a Christian. I am now an ambassador, and you all are privileged to have me sit in this room. Because now I represent a government, and I'm only concerned about my government's interests in this meeting. Do you know that an ambassador never, ever gives his opinion? Did you know that? It is illegal for an ambassador to give his opinion.
See, but you see, we, we, we're too religious. We keep giving our opinions. We're not ambassadors. An ambassador will never say, look at my lips, you will never hear, study all the ambassadors, all the world, 189 countries, not a one of the ambassadors will ever say, I think. Never. It's diplomatic courtesy and legal policy for an ambassador to always say, my government's position is. And that's what God calls you, an ambassador. So if someone asks you to do something that goes against the constitution of your country, this book called the Bible, if they even suggest you do something against the government policy, you don't have to give them your opinion. You're looking for an argument when you give your opinion. You're supposed to say, uh, my government's position is that this is wrong. Well, what do you think about adultery? I don't think about it. But my government's position is, it is sin. Yeah, but, but, but the Lord know how tough... Hey, 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 you ask me for my statement. I don't represent myself. That's what's wrong with most of us. We go to work representing ourselves. Well, what do you think about homosexuality? Well, you know, what I think about it really doesn't matter because I'm an ambassador. But my government position is, based on the Constitution, it's abomination. I don't want no excuse for that. I can't explain. Don't you, if you want to argue with me, go talk to the government. Come on, clap, man. Y'all get this thing. We always talking about trying to argue and discuss the thing. I ain't discussing nothing. You're an ambassador. Christians row. <laughs> Ambassadors will never... Uh, Czech ambassador, they never get into a row. You'll never read in the papers where an ambassador rowed another ambassador. You ever seen it? No. Why? Their statements are already prescribed. They come to the country with their orders already. What do you think that book is in your lap? You know why Jesus was so successful on earth? I figured out his secret. He was an ambassador. Jesus said, I speak nothing of myself. That means I don't talk for myself. I only say what I hear the government say. Come on, praise the Lord. The guy was cool, man. He said, so if you got a problem with my words, talk to my father. He that rejects my word, rejects my father's word. Because I only say what I hear my father say. Yeah. When are we going to learn this? We got to stop being Christians. We're in a kingdom. Let me wrap this up here real quick. Y'all getting blessed this morning. I'm blessing myself. <laughs> Let me tell you what, a, what an ambassadorship does. It takes the pressure off. Don't you feel the pressure getting off? How do you keep, just, just blame everything on the government. Just blame it on the government. Just blame it on the government, you see? Just blame it on the government. Praise God. What I like about ambassadors, too, is that ambassadors don't owe no, nobody. Nothing. You're all slow, man. Before a person is an ambassador, they're in debt. They owe all kind of people money. <laughs> But the minute you are an appointed an ambassador, the government pays all your bills. The government cancels all of your, your, your debts. They take of everything. They pay all your, 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 your obligations. They, they cancel. Why? Because they don't want you to think about nothing except the government's desires. So the disciples started worrying what we will eat, what are we going to drink, what are we going to wear. Christ says in Matthew 6, hey, you guys are ambassadors. Seek ye first the government of God and all of its interests and all these things. They come with the job. (laughs) 
Christians worry, ambassadors sleep. He gave it his beloved sleep. Ooh, just a couple more seconds. Got to give you the sweet one. You know why your prayer life ain't working? You're praying as a Christian. You are not supposed to be praying for things. Why? These things are added. They come with the job. What you're supposed to pray for is, what is God's will? What does God want done in this situation? What is my government's interest in this situation? If you handle the, the government's business, the governor take care of yours. Is that what Jesus was saying? So when a need comes up, a bill comes, you look at it and say, okay, government, take care of that. And then go to sleep. I'm serious about this. Look at it and say, Lord, right now, I got it. Your government got it. Take care of that. I am your ambassador, and you will not make your ambassador a disgrace in the midst of this foreign land. Then go to bed. It's faith. I said, that's faith. Faith comes from what? Understanding your position as an ambassador. An ambassador understands these words of here of kingdom. Dominion means to govern, to rule, to control, to manage, to master, and to lead. And that means that every one of us here was born to be a king, a ruler, over a domain, a territory. And therefore, we supposed to have kingdom, kingdom, dominion, influence over everything in the earth for the King Jesus we serve. Therefore, God's goal is the kingdom of God on earth. Not earth going to heaven. Selah. Selah. Oh Lord, you know my heart. Do you get it? Why do you want to go to heaven? The disciple says, teach us what to pray for. Pray means to ask God. He said, tell us what to ask God for, they said. How do we pray? What do we pray? He says, here's what to pray. Our Father, our government, who are not on earth, <laughs> but in heaven, your name is holy. We reverence your name. Then he said, pray this. Your kingdom come down here. Your will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. He said, don't take heaven to earth. I mean, earth to heaven. He says, ask for heaven to come to earth. We keep praying the opposite. Oh, God, take us to heaven. God said, no, that's not the deal. The assignment is to get heaven on earth. So he said, pray for that. God wants you to go into business or to open up some agency or develop some product because God wants the kingdom to come in that stuff. You need to take your investment your business today and put it before God and say God let your kingdom come through this I want this to prosper for your name's sake your reputation will come through this business <laughs> you want pray for promotion don't pray for promotion for money you don't pray for things say Lord let me get promoted in this company so that I can bring your influence at a higher level. Anybody here before we go home? Say, Lord, I want to go into government because I want your kingdom to come from the political arena. I want to flow down with your kingdom influence. <laughs> it has to do with the assignment. So Jesus' assignment was very clear. The fall of mankind resulted in the instatement of a new kingdom, and Christ came to destroy that kingdom. The Bible says in, John, in, in, uh, in the book of 1 John, it says, <laughs> Christ was manifested to destroy the kingdom of the devil. What's a kingdom? A domain, a rulership. By the way, uh, the word world in the Bible has nothing to do with earth. <laughs> the word earth in the Greek is the word terra, terra. 
uh, the word world in the Bible is the word cosmos. Two different words. Terra, earth, has to do with the physical dirt that we walk on, that the earth, the plants. And that's, that's the terra. But the world is the word cosmos, which means, ready for this, order of influence. The Bible says that we have an earth with two worlds. <laughs> he says, <laughs> be not conformed any longer to this world, that's the world, the order of Satan, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your repentant mind so that you will be in the world but not of that order. <laughs> the world means government. You used to be in the world of the devil. So you used to operate for him. You was his representative. You were doing a good job messing up everybody else. Right, says Dan? I mean, you did a good job dancing in the casino. She was representing a government. But then the Holy Ghost came back into her life, and now she is representing the kingdom of God, and she's still influencing people. Stop being so religious. And start having fun. <laughs> See, Captain, God made you a captain to be on them boats, sir, so you can bring his kingdom in the world of the marine world to influence those captains and those mates and those passengers. When they come, you tell them about God. And tell them the ship can't go down. Why? I got angels keeping this up because I'm an ambassador. Your ship can't sink, Cap. But if you're a Christian, you're single, your ship going to sink. I, oh God, this is supposed to be fun, man. You're supposed to walk around this week with your chest out, walking around as if you own the place, because you do. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.